Okay, so I'm uh, Joe Philpot. I'm a um, consultant uh, general paediatrician, which uh, based at Wexham Park Hospital, part of Frimley Health in Slough. So I look after babies born three and a half months early through to children who are 18 years of age. Um, and I'm going to discuss our experience of introducing point of care testing into the paediatric assessment unit. And it's been quite interesting hearing some of the talks today because from the point of view of ambulatory care, I think we've been doing that in the paediatric world for quite a long time now, actually. Um, so I think it's quite interesting because you get quite divorced from the rest of medicine and to hear about the adult medicine. And, um, and Emma, who is one of my F2 doctors, um, I don't know if it was fortunate or unfortunate. Anyway, we'd done a neonatal round. It was Saturday morning or Sunday. We got through it quite early. We were having coffee, and I was looking for somebody to help me with this and to look and analyse the uh, figures. So Emma is going to present the results, and I'm going to do the... A uh, bit to describe how we got there in the first place. So this is a busy slide, but this is Wexham Park Hospital. It's also, some of you may have heard of it, it was a failing hospital, although there are good bits of Liddles, and I like to think that paediatrics was a good bit of it. Anyway, and we got acquired, so we're actually one of the very few successful acquisitions. We're already very happy now in Frimley Health with um, the chief exec of the old Frimley Park Hospital. But all I wanted to point out on there is there is the um, A&E, &A &E, or emergency and there is the paediatric assessment unit. So it is probably the furthest point away from ED, but it is next to Labour Ward, which probably is more important. Um, and so that paediatric assessment unit has uh, been there for oh, 15 years. It's next door to the ward, and um, every paediatric assessment unit in the country is slightly different. This one is the main point of entry as far as paediatric goes. So that unit takes referrals from um, ED. We're not in ED. There's not enough doctors just to man this bit, let alone being at the other end of the hospital. So we take referrals from ED unless the child is too ill to go up the corridor without us seeing them first or they're a resus situation. We take referrals from GPs. We take referrals from midwives, health visitors social services and we also have a cohort of what we call open access patients so the area that this assessment unit covers is quite a deprived area it's the most diverse population outside London we have a lot of complex uh, medical children so they have open access they just have to phone this unit and they come in they don't go through primary care or secondary care uh, before seeing us and then in that paediatric assessment unit having arrived you have an assessment and that might be an assessment and you go off immediately, an assessment and a period of observation, an assessment and an immediate admission onto the children's ward or an assessment observation and finally you get admitted onto the children's ward. So there's lots of different ways, but it's fully staffed with, well, hopefully fully staffed with nursing. I mean, we don't have enough paediatric nurses in the country. So you've got to have administration, you've got to have healthcare assistants, nurses, and you've got to have doctors. And the one change in the last 10 years is the continual increase of uh, consultant um, delivered care. So we've got consultants in there now, um, in, in the sort of 10 years ago, the consultant covering the ward would also cover paediatric assessment unit. Now we've got consultants on the unit every afternoon. We've got consultants carrying the registrar middle grade bleep now from five till 10 o'clock every night. We've got extra input in there between three and nine at weekends. The downside of that is that paediatric consultants are retiring very early. And that thought of not sleeping through the night just doesn't exist in paediatric land. So that's the background of this paediatric assessment unit. Over when I first fell into the management world, which I'm also in the management world now, for the first sort of since about 2010 or 11, we spent a lot of work with uh, Bucks and Berkshire trying to keep children, as we've discussed today, rightly so, out, out of this paediatric assessment unit, trying to keep them in, in the home being assessed in the community. So there was an urgent care board where we had commissioners, uh, primary care physicians, myself, uh, somebody else from Bucks. And first of all, we looked at the common pathways. Again, in paediatrics, there's five big pathways. You know, five, if you hit those pathways and keep them out, you would have sorted out a lot of the referrals. So you know, things like wheeze, gastroenteritis, bronchiolitis, fever in the under fives. Uh, because there were a couple of asthma deaths in the area in about in the community in 2012-13 we had uh, some work with joint uh, working between primary care and secondary care with asthma nurses which again has been um, valued and been very successful 
um, from the point of view of patient experience, and the asthma bus, which uh, was a very, um, we've got a little picture at the bottom. So over the summer holidays, lots of teenagers feel better, the weather's good, they don't take their inhalers or they take them less, and then they go into secondary care, and for some of them it's their first year into, sorry, into secondary school. And then in September, you get a peak of asthma admissions because they all get little coughs and colds and their asthma goes up. So this bus goes around in September into the second, uh, secondary schools, talking to young teenagers with asthma, making sure they've got their inhalers, making sure they know how to use it. So that was quite really well received and um, quite an innovative idea. Uh, frequent flyers, we looked at um, families and children who were coming into A&E um, and going and visiting them at home and seeing if there's any way we could look at their care and keep them in primary care. And the other thing I put in red, which I'm not going to discuss, but I think has been really exciting, is we did an extended hotline for a year where GPs and primary care could directly talk to a consultant, paediatrician, about anything. Uh, for between nine in the morning and 10 at night, seven days a week. And if you look at those figures, that did have an effect on keeping children in the community. But despite all of that work, these, it looks a busy slide, but it's not that busy. So we had a, you know, back uh, 12 years ago, we were doing ambulatory care. And despite everything, the numbers are just going up and up and up. So if you just look in 2012, there's only four or five months where there were more than 600 in a month. When you get, you know, four years later, there's only one month where it isn't more than 600. Only two years ago, you only went, only a year ago, you only went, we only went over 800 in a couple of months. Last year, we were over 800 in half the year. So the numbers are just increasing. If you look at the true admission rate, so our idea, these, these go down as zero length of stay. But if you look at the true admission rate, it's been flat. We don't admit any more kids into the children's ward now than we did in 2005. When I last looked at a big audit in about 2012, if you were a GP referral, you had a one in three chance of being truly admitted, a th two out of three chance of us assessing you and sending you back into the community. Last year, that had gone to a one in five. So, you know, 20% of the kids actually truly come into the paediatric ward. Four out of five times, we assess you and you go back out into the community. So despite all this work, there was no evidence we were stopping people coming in. So then I got quite, we were on one of the urgent care boards. I think I was looking a bit like that, actually. And I hadn't really heard of point of care testing because I, I, well, there are some bit of point of care testing uh, in the trust, but it wasn't something that had really gone, uh, you know, I'd really thought about. But so what I was interested in is that we can't, it's showing very little effect of reducing people attending. Could we at least speed up, I, I'm going to use the word flow, the flow of children through the unit? Because in that time of those increased numbers, we haven't got a bigger unit. We haven't got more beds. We haven't got a bigger waiting area. We haven't got more doctors. We've definitely got less training doctors. We haven't got more nurses. So it was becoming, it was safe, but it was, it, we, I was very interested to see if we could deal with that volume and that increased volume. In a, in a much more effective um, way. On the background that everybody knows that sepsis is, you know, you cannot miss sepsis and you certainly cannot miss sepsis in the paediatric world. We're just completely terrified of that. So when the old days you'd see a cough and cold, I'm the worst person to assess a cough and cold really because I think a cough and cold is, you know, pneumococcal little proved otherwise. GPs should be assessing cough and cold, but we are seeing more and more and we were getting into this thing of doing more and more blood tests and then they take long time as the audit will show to come through. So we'd, we were trying to move these children through four out of five who really don't need to be in a hospital setting and so I was very interested to see if this would speed up and the question I wanted to ask is would it increase the speed of decision making so we've got senior decision makers in there anyway but would we make decisions quicker I didn't see it altering the decision I didn't see it altering whether they stayed or went just would it make it quicker and so this is the uh, machine that we use which uh, we had on trial so I'd like to thank Kariba so we had it for three months um, and in fact we still just got it now but it's gonna end very quickly and uh, we, we just had the full blood count and the CRP we also had access to um, blood gas which would give us a blood gas and a lactate which we had anyway and you can get some use and ease on that but I was really interested in the full blood count and CRP so setting it up always takes much longer than you think it's going to. I thought it was going to be fairly simple. It took quite a long time. I'd like to thank everybody on the slide uh, that helped do that. So we had to think where we were going to put it. So we didn't have a point of care testing room ready, but we found one. Um, how are you going to connect it all up? Training, who are we going to train? We could train 30 people. Who are they going to be? Um, 
and also what to audit. And we got quite tied up in what level of CRP cutoff are you going to have? What cutoff are you going to have for full blood count? What? And I thought, actually, we don't need to have that decision because we're not changing what we do. I don't have a cutoff for CRP now. It's just we're changing the speed of which we're getting that information back. And once I could see around that, it became easier. And also, what children are you going to test? And actually, I didn't, I thought, if I start saying you can only do it on this child or that child, it's going to get a bit, you know, get very confusing. So I said, look, if you'd normally do a full blood count and CRP, then just do point of care testing as well as the usual um, blood tests that you would do. So I didn't say you had to do it for this, this situation, it just kept it open really. And we had to create um, an audit form, which is always more difficult as well than it seems, um, which Emma is going to talk through. Or do you want me to talk? I'll talk through the audit form. So in retrospect, I should have done it slightly differently, um, but actually, um, we managed to get all the information we wanted to. So what I wanted, we had the time the blood was taken, the time it was analysed on the point of care testing machine, the time of the decision, whatever, the, I didn't care what the decision was, but what time was the decision made, when the laboratory blood was available, and the time of discharge or admission, which in fact we could have lost that a little bit. And whether, when we got the full blood count back, because as you say, doctors are always a bit uncertain about whether that blood test is really accurate, was any uh, change in that decision made. Um, and finally, some people made a comment. So I didn't think it was a particularly complicated audit form, but like we've discussed already, bringing anything new into a small unit, I, anyway, we'll talk about the figures. It was, it was, it drove me to distraction, basically. But anyway, that was what we had, and I thought it was going to be fairly simple. Right, Emma's going to talk through the um, results. Yeah, so just a quick touch on the results. So um, as we said, obviously, we were in a department we were trying to improve flow, flow. So introducing a document that people had to fill out in a department we were trying to improve flow wasn't always going to be filled out to perfection. Um, but we managed, over the three-month trial period, to have um, 173 children tested on the point of care machine with the full blood count and CRP, as well as those all having um, uh, tests sent to the formal lab. In this situation, we knew that these devices were, were effective, that they were getting accurate answers, so it wasn't something we were looking into to compare the results, even though we do have the information, actually, as has previously been stated, they were just as accurate. The only thing of note was that when a CRP got too high, it wasn't measurable on the machine, and we had to get a lab confirmation of it. But looking at the actual results that we found, so of all of those patients, there were 81 forms that were actually created in our paediatric assessment unit. And unfortunately, only six one of those were actually completed. And that was just giving the times. Because um, obviously, multiple of those, although they started filling them out, it was actually getting back to deciding whether the decision was made and whether or not they were um, admitted or discharged. So coming on to the next, we had to do a lot of work as a result of that, going through ICE, which is our platform for blood results, to work out how exactly effective this was. And we concluded that about 106 of them were actually ones where we could determine whether or not it had made an effect or whether or not it hadn't. Unfortunately, there was a significant proportion that fell into the unknown pile the majority of which were when a child had been admitted. And so there was actually very little evidence to suggest whether or not that had been based off the back of a point of care, although more often than not, it probably was, because we found that actually there was over a three hour delay between getting our point of care results and the actual formal FBC and CRP coming back from the lab. Um, and or whether or not they did actually wait for the um, lab results or whether or not actually it was just based on clinical assessment alone. So it's disappointing, but actually what we did find is that of those 106, 82% of those showed that we did have a faster patient flow. So this predominantly was our early discharges. So it was getting the kind of clinical assessment, doing that point of care for blood count and CRP. In the majority of cases, as we said, it was looking at sepsis. So these were patients that had presented with fever and seeing that we could get those results and turn them around quickly and they were gone hours before anything came back from the lab. Um, what we really wanted to look at, which unfortunately became a bit of a problem, was looking at whether or not this affected early um, antibiotic administration, because obviously that's looking at sepsis is a really, really big topic at the moment. Um, we couldn't do so, but anecdotally, they were saying it is very, very good in order to do that. Seeing those high CRPs, seeing those elevated white cell counts in these young children did lead to those decisions to maybe either turn them around with antibiotics and sending them home, um, or actually admitting them and giving them antibiotics very early on. Um, the 19 in which we saw no effect 
was actually more often than not because instead of just doing a full blood count and CRP, which is generally the standard protocol in little ones, um, we were awaiting other bloods. So whether or not that was LFTs, in some cases it was uh, malaria screens or LFTs, but also things like LPs or ECGs. And actually they're the things that were delaying it rather than the blood count itself. Um, and so there was some discussion to be had, as we said, is whether we do these point of care testings in all the children that come through, or if we're actually gonna be waiting for other things, whether or not we leave that aside and we just wait for the formal results. And actually these are for the people that we can rapidly turn around or we can rapidly admit. Um, and yeah, the pie chart just says much of the same. So I'll hand you back over to Dr. Phil Pop. And then the, so I think in conclusion, um, I think we learned that despite, I thought it being a, um, a fairly small project, it still was really complicated to get those audit forms filled out and, um, and to get all the detail. Although, as Emma said, we could backtrack and get onto the IT system, at least look at what time the discharge summary was produced. And then we could tell if it was before the, the um, blood result was back on the ICE system. So we know that in those decisions, uh, in those situations, the child was discharged. And I think there was you know, evidence that we were able to make faster decision making and those uh, children were able to get discharged off the unit back home um, quicker, which has to be safer from the point of view of you know, producing a good patient flow and also a pa better patient experience. I think there was evidence in the ones where I did look through with higher CRPs, where we could see what time antibiotic uh, were given, that there was evidence with high CRPs, if it hadn't been recognised in A&E already, or, that we were giving antibiotics quicker. So I think that is something that will be uh, a reason for really pushing this. Um, and I think next, this case now is that I want to put a business case to Frimley Health. I think the difficulty with this is that it is hard for me to show actual money saving because we're not changing what actually happens to the patient at the end. We're changing the speed of what happens to that patient, which to me seems very worthwhile and, and common sense. But when I've got to put it through and fight for my little bit with everybody else, and I am a paediatrician, and there's more exciting things in Frimley Health than a paediatrician, I think that's going to be a bit of a battle. But um, hopefully going forward, uh, that is what I want to do by the end of July, because I think it is something that will increase the flow through the assessment unit. And, um, and I think with all the sepsis drive, I think actually it'll become apparent that also it'll be uh, for the people who need a bit more and the risk adverse, that it will also be very useful. Thank you.